Hank Haven. I joined Air Force ROTC at Southern Methodist University and graduated in May 1965. I went on active duty to pilot training at Vance Air Force Base, Oklahoma at the end of July. I trained in the T-41, a high-wing Cessna 172, the T-37, a small underpowered jet trainer that turned JP-4 to noise, and the T-38 built by Northrop that we affectionately call the bottle rocket. It could accelerate going straight up after takeoff or immediately fly out of a complete stall on final approach. It was a remarkable experience. Upon receiving my wings, the Air Force sent me to survival school, radar school, then on to a replacement training unit at George Air Force Base, California. I was to be a co-pilot in the F-4C Phantom II. We trained in all forms of aerial combat, learning how to drop bombs, fire rockets, strafe targets, and shoot missiles, as well as air-to-air -air refueling both day and night. Our initial air combat tactics training in the F-4C was a two-week, 10-sortie flight course designed to give the basics. Co-pilots and navigators only flew on six of those training sorties. It was the bare minimum that we would need to go into combat. The training material was from books published in the Korean War, but with a small amount of new additional material. Our kill ratios in World War II and Korea were 12 to 1. We would have to learn on the job about how to fight the MiGs. In July 1967, I was sent to the 558 TAC Fighter Squadron, Cameron Bay Air Base, South Vietnam. We flew three kinds of missions, close air support, route reconnaissance or route recce's, in combat sky spots. We flew close air support missions when our troops were in close contact with the enemy. Our flights were controlled by a forward air controller or a FAC. Route recce's allowed us to look for targets of opportunity along the roads the enemy would use. These were done outside of South Vietnam and away from troops, so FACs weren't needed. Bombing tactics were much the same as close air support missions except for higher dive angles and release altitudes to avoid enemy ground and any aircraft gunfire. The video gives you a good idea of what happens in close air support missions and the type of weapons we use. Combat sky spots were like doing a ground-controlled approach at 20,000 feet. 
The ground controllers would compute the effects of winds on the bombs we would drop. They would direct us to a point in space where we would release our weapons. The controllers and operations made sure there were no friendly troops within five miles of the drop zone. North Korea captured the USS Pueblo on January 23, 1968. I flew my 152nd and last Vietnam mission on January 31st. My combat tested squadron was sent TDY to Korea on February 4th to provide combat support. We joined up with the 4th Type Fighter Wing at Kunsan Air Base, commanded by Colonel Chuck Yeager. I would eventually meet Colonel Yeager a couple of years later and bent an elbow with him at the Stag Bar at Holloman Air Force Base. We moved into our refurbished base at Taegu in the middle of March. It had better accommodations for all of our troops. The South Koreans were still flying F-86 fighters and C-46 transports. This was equipment we had left them from their conflict in the 50s. They were glad to see us. I set up the operations command post for the squadron because I had been a command post duty controller for the wing at Cameron. We set alert for air defense. We intercepted unknown aircraft when they tested our defenses. They would turn around and go home. We also flew combat air patrol or CAP missions protecting South Korean coast and along the Korean DMZ. The planes were loaded with air-to-air -air missiles and Gatling guns. We didn't expect any trouble, but we were ready for it in any case. When tensions quieted down, we did training. In June 68, my tour of duty in Southeast Asia was ending. I had to go back to Cameron to process out. They asked me to perform one more duty while I was in country, escorting a beautiful USO actress. I showed her around the base and the flight line, which really impressed her. I think our aircraft maintenance and weapons airmen were just as impressed with her and very envious of me. 
The next day, my bags packed, I headed over to the aeroport to catch a Brana flight with stewardesses and culottes back to the States. Danged if I wasn't full. Eight hours later, a few other GIs and myself were able to get aboard a C-141 that was headed for Travis Air Force Base. The back end of that bird was very cold. I found out from the crew that the heat could be in the cockpit or in the cargo bay. Guess who got the heat? I broke into my bags and pulled out some of my extra fatigues for the GIs to use. That made it a little better. Since we were flying a polar route, we stopped off in Japan and Alaska to refuel. We were on the ground both times for about 30 minutes before getting back into the air. Our plane touched down at Travis Air Force Base, California around 4 a.m. Pacific time. I knelt down and kissed the ramp because I was glad to get home. After three weeks at home, I went to Holloman Air Force Base, New Mexico. The 49th TAC Fighter Wing was being reformed after many years in Europe, and Major Stolle and I were the first two officers there. We divided up the list of people coming in from Europe and Vietnam into the three squadrons. I was crewed with Jack Ryan, a Vietnam pilot and son of General Ryan. We made a good team. In mid-October, six captains, three from Europe and three from Nam, got our heads together and started an air combat tactics training syllabus that would eventually develop into the Navy's top gun school and the Air Force's Red Flag program. Both programs are still going today. These next pictures show how a dogfight develops between two fighters. Start at the bottom, work up through the middle, and then down and around the outside of the diagram. The fighter that flies the slowest will be the winner. We went to Europe in February 1969 in the first exercise to show that we could support NATO in case of war. I got a chance to visit six countries during the two and a half months I was there. The flight back to Holloman took 12 hours. Just think of sitting in one place on a thin cushioned straight back chair for that long. Not fun. At the end of 1969, I started my upgrade to aircraft commander. My flight lead was ecstatic during the debriefing after a dogfight practice with me. He told me that everybody had been gunning for me because nobody could get me in their sights, and he was the first. I had no idea that I had been the target for the entire squadron. All I was doing was keeping everybody cornered at my 6 o'clock. I did enjoy those flights.